Toby, take it away. All right. Good day, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today's session. Uh, this is another one of our quarterly reviews, and it really gives us all an opportunity to brush up on our knowledge, uh, collaborate with each other, and also take a look at some of the new features that have come along so that we might also reach out to our customers and uh, help them uh, with their day-to-day -day tasks and <clears throat> show them what's going on with the Commvault Advantage. So let's jump right into today's session and start off with some service pack specifics. All right, so service pack 13 was officially released on September 15th, so just about a month ago. And uh, currently, the automatic download cadence is set to 60 days. So you'll see the uh, latest service pack hit those cloud update sites um, around November 15th. So if you have that automatic download schedule enabled inside of the console, uh, that's about the time it should probably be pulled down. Now you can also go ahead and pull it down manually through the uh, cloud website, the Commvault store, or uh, the maintenance advantage site. So if you go to cloud.commvault.com or uh, store.commvault.com, you'll see right up at the home page here, we have the latest service pack release. Uh, also under media kits is another place you can pull it down. Uh, from this area, you can also pull down previous service packs and previous version software as well. Uh, as well as the hotfix packs. So the hotfix packs, what those uh, bundles do, those are loose updates since the service pack has been released. Uh, those are available approximately every Tuesday. We got another one out just this week. And what that allows you to do is to apply hotfixes to whatever service pack you currently have deployed. So as you can see here, by the naming convention, there are hotfix packs available for the previous service packs as well. Now, why might you need this? Well, in some cases, the environment um, uh, maybe has a more rigid uh, update or release cycle in terms of uh, maintenance. And uh, the other thing too is service packs not only introduce new features and enhancements, but can sometimes change behavior of an existing product. So um, kind of want to be careful about that and maybe perhaps do your diligence in terms of studying up what's going to happen on a given agent or product or feature uh, prior to the upgrade in those cases. So the hotfix packs, what those allow you to do is continue to apply uh, fixes to known bugs with the hotfixes uh, without upgrading to the service pack itself, which may contain uh, some additional features. So right there uh, within the Commvault store is where you can pull those down. You can also pull them down through the Maintenance Advantage website. Now, when you go to the Downloads and Packages section here in Maintenance Advantage, you're going to be confronted with this matrix. So this matrix has been around for a little while. What it provides us with is some guidance on uh, where we should be at in terms of the uh, deployed updates inside of the environment. So we're kind of considering at this point that Service Pack 12 is very well baked. It's been around for about four months uh, in the field, and uh, it's considered a mainstream release. So right from here, you could also download the software or the hotfix packs. For uh, POCs and new installations, you definitely want to go with the latest and greatest. So pull down uh, Service Pack 13. And uh, if you're on one of these older Service Packs, well, uh, the chart here is indicating that it might be time to consider upgrading. So that's a little bit of guidance that you can pass along to the customer uh, if they're looking for uh, any sort of feedback in terms of when should I update or upgrade. Uh, you'll also find this on the documentation page. So right on the home page here, you'll notice that Service Pack 12 is sort of um, up front and uh, regarded as the mainstream release. So when you do a search, uh, it, perhaps on uh, one of today's topics, uh, you may be searching the Service Pack 12 documentation. So note here that on the lower left-hand side is where you'll find uh, the Service Pack 13 documentation as well as the admin console documentation. And then in the middle here, you can locate the, uh, the previous releases documentation um, as well as the previous versions. So uh, when you're engaged in a uh, customer site and uh, either talking about a feature or function, just be aware that um, 
it, it may be uh, the documentation may be different for that particular uh, service pack. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of things as far as what's new for service pack 13. So I'm going to click on what's new. Um, just wanted to kind of highlight what's available here in the documentation site because this is also another way we can help educate our customers on how to find information. A lot of it is out there and here in the documentation site, for example, there's no login required to find this information. So if we click on what's new under announcements, uh, we're going to see quite a few uh, bits of information in terms of uh, you know what's what's new. Um, here's some uh, individual announcements here. Also has links to the available service packs and changes also on the left hand side. And um, the availability of service pack 13, some end of life announcements, and uh, some other loose uh, updates or announcements here. Now there is a couple of items that we want to talk about today including these uh, deprecated or end of life items. So each time a service pack comes out or a new version of the software, it's important to also consider what might be actually sunsetting or retiring. So in this case, we have a couple of items for Service Pack 13, that being the SharePoint Server uh, 2007 support has ended as of Service Pack 13. We also, the feature, the database direct access for the SharePoint Server agent has uh, ended as also in Service Pack 13. Um, and then going forward, there's also a couple announcements here for Service Pack 14. Um, the Infinisher for SharePoint support is ending and also in Service Pack 14, uh, which is coming up in December timeframe. The SharePoint Storage Manager will be ending uh, or projected to end here in Service Pack 14. So again, that's upcoming stuff uh, just a few months away. So if you have any accounts that may have those uh, products or features uh, deployed, um, you might want to uh, reach out and, and just provide that advisory. Now there are ways to uh, work with uh, degraded agents and things like that. Um, that's also noted here on the documentation site. So let's take a look at what else is uh, new here. So um, on the, uh, the new features in version 11, uh, this is a, a great page to kind of see uh, a summary of all the latest changes. And then if you click on the changes link here, this is one of my favorites because it provides a matrix and in service pack 13 here, it's actually organized chronologically by service pack. So uh, kudos to the documentation team for getting that organized uh, that way. So not everything that's new or different is listed in here, but there are quite a few highlights. Uh, so for example, in the past couple of service packs, we've been talking about the Windows updates requirement. Uh, there uh, in Service Pack 13, there's a couple of additional changes we need to be aware of, such as for any V10 COM cells, if they're out there, you can no longer download updates through the COM cell console for version 10. Um, so uh, the workaround there would, uh, you'd need to use the Commvault store or maintenance advantage or something like that. Um, so just a little bit of motivation uh, to uh, get those environments upgraded if for whatever reason there are any out there. Uh, other couple of updates here uh, with the Outlook add-in if you're deploying any of those packages, uh, .NET uh, 4.5 will be deployed with it. And we also have a new Hadoop installation package. Uh, this is uh, replacing, uh, previously we would deploy the file system agent on, on the, uh, the Hadoop nodes. So that's something that's new there too. So that's the change matrix. If you look over on the left hand side and continue navigating to uh, the available service packs under service pack 13, here's where you can also download the newsletter. So uh, this is one of the items that's actually out there uh, for you in that link that Jim posted in the uh, chat panel um, that you can pull down. The Newsletter allows you uh, to take a moment and reach out to the customer, see how they're doing, offer some assistance, and say, hey, check out the check out the new features here in Service Pack 13. So again, not everything's going to be included inside of the newsletter, but it's a good uh, tool or vehicle to uh, make that touch uh, to the account and see how everything is going. Um, now, over on the left-hand side, we have uh, new features listed out 
in terms of uh, Service Pack 13, uh, the hot fixes, the known hot fixes, as well as the documentation for them. Again, you can pull those down from the Commvault store. And uh, any known issues uh, are also listed here too. Lastly, let's take a look at early release features. So uh, we're going to be talking about a few of these today. Uh, it's going to be a jam-packed 90-minute session, and we're going to go through quite a few of these. Uh, but there's more that we won't cover today, and this is a good place that you can take a look at other early release features that are that are pretty cool. Um, all right, so moving right along here, let's jump back into our presentation. Um, so this presentation, like I say, I hope uh, you find helpful. It's a, a comprehensive set of uh, information, not just about new things, but also uh, maybe perhaps a little bit of guidance on support and architecture and, and some fun stuff too. So for all of the topics, we do have a uh, sort of a reference guide put together for you. That's in the download section, and you can pull that down. So these are basically uh, this bookmarked uh, by topic, and so all of the topics that we're covering today uh, wherever possible, I provided a link, and you can jump right to that uh, topic within the documentation. All right, so moving right along here, uh, again, uh, the, the hotfix packs and service packs are available through store.convault.com or cloud.convault.com. Uh, don't forget about that uh, mainstream release uh, cycle, that guidance we have available, also available through the Maintenance Advantage site. All right, let's talk about a few other additional resources that you have to stay current. All right, so we just walked through these items on the documentation site. Now, one other thing that I'd like to note is these other tools that are right on the home page uh, for the documentation site. Off on the right-hand side, we have a link to the knowledge base. Uh, we have the virtual server agent features matrix. This one is uh, very nice, and it will compare and contrast uh, the different hypervisor and feature and functions. So why do I bring this up? Pretty much each and every time we have one of these sessions is because uh, when we're talking about um, new features, a lot of times uh, they're released uh, in favor of a particular hypervisor. In a lot of cases, uh, a new feature is introduced relative to VMware or Hyper-V or something like that, maybe AWS or Azure. And um, uh, we don't want to misconstrue that with um, all of the platforms. Now, ideally, everything would work alike, but not all of the different hypervisors work the same. So uh, be sure to check out that matrix whenever you're talking about virtualized uh, platforms. The same thing with IntelliSnap here. So uh, Convault is definitely one of the uh, products out there that has the widest array of uh, engine hardware. Uh, support as well as cloud vendor. So look at that. Look at that list. These tools are very, very simple and easy to use. So you can spot check those items um, whenever talking about either a hardware array, a cloud platform, or a hypervisor platform. All right. With that, let's keep moving on here. Uh, another resource for you is the on-demand learning library. So what is this? This is a, a site that was launched uh, earlier this year through the Education Advantage or the Education Services team. Uh, what it provides is an on-demand uh, learning library, just like the name. So if you go to ea.convault.com, again, this is available for all audiences, internal employees. It is available for partners. It is available for customers. And it is a subscription-based uh, learning platform and along with each subscription, you also get the traditional instructor-led training credits, depending on what level of subscription you might uh, choose to use. Now, you can also see a, a sample here if you click on this link. So without any sort of login, you can kind of get a sense of what type of content is out there. What's cool about this site is um, it provides you an array of learning potential. So whatever you prefer, if you prefer to read text, if you want to watch videos, if you like to look at graphics and images to kind of help the concept, all of that's contained here. So 
here's some featured items, including some uh, Service Pack 13 notes. Um, you can take a look at the, um, the admin console documentation, for example. Uh, these are all uh, embedded videos, and like I say, a lot of these items include uh, text, so you can read about the uh, content that's being discussed as well as watching a video. Makes it really, really easy to conform to whatever uh, sort of learning mechanism that you're into uh, at the moment. So uh, late at night, after hours, if you want to watch a video, uh, it's all available there. So again, that's through ea.convault.com. Check it out when you get a chance. And we don't want to forget about our partners. Um, we have updated the partner portal. In the new partner portal is a lot of updated tools. Um, not only uh, did we update the licensing platforms, but also the quoting tool as well. So uh, if you take a look, jump over there real quick to take a look at a couple of these items. All right, here it is. I'm going to log in real quick. So this is the uh, refreshed partner portal. Uh, right on the home page, you've got a couple of links here that will link you directly to uh, presentation assets, uh, the quoting tool, and other resources to uh, pro you know, help the account and, and process information. So uh, the other thing we have here is the partner success desk. Um, so there's lots of different uh, advertisements that are going, about, uh, going out regarding this information. The Partner Success Desk is there to uh, help our partners in terms of um, answering questions around a, a quote or perhaps a, a license uh, part number or SKU. Um, and uh, there are regional 800 numbers around the world. So don't forget about the new uh, quoting tool. And there's also the link to Partner University, which is also another resource. So within Partner University, or Commvault University for internal employees. A couple of things you might want to look at in terms of uh, licensing, for example, is going to be um, the uh, overview of the new licensing packages. So there is a training module out there. Oops. There we go. There we go. So packaging and pricing learning module. This is something that you may want to take a look at. Um, there are a couple of other ones, uh, like the overview here. Uh, this one is only 17 minutes in length, so it gives you kind of a high-level overview of some of the new pricing and packaging. Um, in my uh, experience with Commvault, uh, this is by far uh, the greatest evolution ever. Um, you know, way better than the capacity-based licensing or anything else. So it's gotten a lot simpler, which means uh, quoting is a lot simpler, and uh, probably uh, the turnaround time and exceptions are fewer. So uh, be sure to check out that training. We also have the license champion uh, module. The um, pop that in real quick. This little program here, this is an additional item that you can do uh, if you want to become a licensing expert. Uh, what happens with this uh, program here called the Licensing Champion, it enables you to become part of a sort of a membership, a little miniature licensing club of folks, and uh, they uh, will uh, offer to send you out information sort of ahead of the curve or or um, you know, you'll be some of the first to know if you become one of those licensed champions. So check out those two items there. Uh, don't forget about the Commvault University and the new partner portal. All right, so the next segment here is uh, related to the ComCell. In this segment, what I try to cover is anything that's going to impact a deployment or upgrade, things of that nature, anything that's ComCell-wide uh, settings and things of that nature. So uh, one of the things that I've been doing since Service Pack 6 is putting together what I call the installation review for the ComServe server. What this is is a document. It's also in the downloads, uh, the takeaway for today's session. Um, it's a review of setup.exe and the ComServe server installation. 
So it will actually walk through all of the installation pages and note any of the subtle changes that have occurred since the previous service pack. So uh, sometimes uh, the packages that we have, the names will change. Some, some of them will be uh, uh, deprecated. Uh, they'll go away, and new things will also be introduced. So what this uh, presentation does is highlight some of those items without you needing to fire up a lab and figure out what's different um, with the service pack release. Hopefully it will save you guys some time. And um, inside of the speaker notes section, anything that has changed since the previous service pack is noted there. And a couple of examples for Service Pack 13 is the MediaGent Core package is replaced by the Storage Accelerator package. So a uh, slight name change. We're going to talk about that package a little bit later on today. And uh, there's also uh, Service Pack 13 offers the Wireshark, Wireshark package inside of the Tools menu. So um, be on the lookout for that. Pull that down. If you could, uh, please let me know if that's a good resource for you. It does take a couple of cycles uh, each quarter to put that together. And um, as I said, it's been around uh, since SP6, so you can kind of follow the changes um, as uh, the service packs are released. All right, so we, uh, re we covered this already. Let's skip over this. And as well as the licensing. Um, covered this already. Let's jump right into the index and deduplication segment. So in this segment, uh, what I try to cover is anything related to the index catalog information, uh, the V2 index, and, um, and of course, deduplication. So for a couple of service packs now, we've been talking about enhancements for V2 index. And one of them that came along uh, back in service pack 11 was uh, changing uh, where you would see uh, index servers and also uh, the uh, logical protection for the uh, index databases. So in Service Pack 11, uh, we introduced the um, sort of the uh, group or pseudo client that's on a per service uh, storage policy basis that creates a logical entity inside of the console browser. Uh, and its job is to protect uh, the catalog information for that given storage policy. So why is that important? Well, uh, if you have multiple media agents, they may actually be servicing multiple storage policies. And to just simply back up the uh, index uh, database subclient wouldn't necessarily give you a comprehensive view of uh, things pertaining to a given service, uh, storage policy, rather. So uh, that's kind of the idea behind that entity there. So what's new for Service Pack 13? Well, um, we have this index load report. Uh, why is this important? Well, with V2 indexing, what can happen? Again, if you had uh, four or five media agents within a pool, and uh, the way V2 indexing works is the initial index server that's touched by the backup job uh, will also own that, uh, that given client's uh, index information. Um, until such a time, uh, you either manually move it or something like that. And if that media agent number one is always first up in the queue, uh, it could potentially, uh, over time, uh, be imbalanced as compared to other media agents in the pool, depending on how the settings are, are set up. So uh, there's a couple things that have uh, been uh, available to uh, provide some uh, assistance with um, uh, load balancing, one of which is this uh, workflow for uh, rebalancing or leveling out copying over uh, catalog information to alternate servers, that's available, and the index load report. So both of these items are available through the Commvault store. That you can download um, and simply uh, go to the home page here, type in index, and we should see both of those. Uh, you can also jump to uh, the uh, workflow section or the report section uh, to pull that up. So let's take a look. Uh, for Service Pack 13, load balance index servers. Uh, so this is the uh, workflow. And then uh, for the reports, let's see what we have here. Index server load report. So this is a recently released uh, report that you can pull down and import into the comm cell. Uh, you can view it either from the web console or the admin console, either one. And what's kind of cool about this report 
is with that workflow in place, uh, you can actually uh, execute the workflow right from the report. All right, so let's take a look at the uh, report itself. Uh, it gives you the uh, standard tiles with the various colors uh, that we have in all of the different dashboard scenes. I kind of get an idea what the colors indicate, and um, and perhaps that will uh, give you a chance to uh, get ahead of a situation. So uh, let's take a look at the how it works here. So if you log into the uh, web console, and uh, this is assuming that you have uh, both of those items imported already, and we'll open up the index server load report here and take a look. Uh, gives us that dashboard type of view. Of course, it is uh, interactive. This is a little bit of a lab here, so there's not a whole lot of information, but um, any of these charts, uh, you can uh, you know jump to any trouble spots. Uh, it gives you that option you know, to quickly, quickly uh, jump to the problem area. Um, and uh, then up at the top here is where you'll find a button. Again, assuming that you have that workflow imported, you can actually execute it right from here. So you click on that, and uh, it'll basically start a job for you to try to, uh, to re uh, rebalance uh, some of the catalog information across the available media agents. So if you take a look inside of the uh, admin console, uh, it will initiate a job. Uh, you know, executing that workflow. Now, is this something that you actually have to do frequently? <clears throat> now, you may not ever have to do it at all, but it's another tool that you can use uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, routine maintenance, um, a health check maybe uh, would be a good time, uh, you know, to take a look, uh, you know, once a quarter or six months or something like that. Um, and um, <clears throat> again, it's a couple of tools that kind of automate the situation for you. So. Uh, check those out. Those are available from uh, the Commvault store. All right, something else for Service Pack 13 in the deduplication uh, topic. Uh, we have uh, opened up the deduplication block size. can now go up to 1024, uh, so one megabyte in block size. So what is this useful for? Primarily it's going to be useful for uh, the larger uh, digital repositories like uh, x-rays or some sort of media uh, where uh, there isn't a lot of redundant information on those uh, compressed images or media files, for example. Uh, so there's no need to uh, have a more granular uh, deduplication effort uh, when they're, you know, you're dealing with the larger files that um, aren't very redundant in the first place. Um, the other area where this could help is perhaps on uh, cloud storage uh, mount paths uh, would improve the restore speed. And uh, as we talked about back in last quarter, so we're talking 12, um, the uh, default for cloud storage targets actually became a 512K block size. So again, uh, that performance enhancement in mind uh, for recoveries, uh, it's now a default uh, for cloud storage tar uh, targets. Excuse me. So takeaway here is you can also increase the deduplication block size up to a megabyte in size. All right, let's jump into the admin console segment. So lots of new stuff inside of the admin console. Let's take a look. All right, so bang, right away when you log in, there's a couple of new features uh, to assist with the navigation effort throughout the admin console, making it uh, you know even quicker and easier to use. So right up at the top, we have a favorites button, a history button, as well as a built-in search bar, which allows you to search for entities within the console. So how do these work? Well, uh, the favorites is pretty straightforward. You can flag any of the items within the uh, navigation pane as a favorite, and it will appear on the list there. Well, how would that help? Well, that would actually uh, help the individual end user if they simply want to look at reports all day, Every day, uh, there's no need to look at the rest of the navigation pane. So rather than um, doing a, um, uh, a customization, we can simply set a favorite. All right, for the search feature here, you can look for any uh, any of the entities within uh, the environment. So it's kind of designed to um, help you quickly locate like a server, for example, a uh, policy or a plan 
and whatever keyword you put in there, uh, the results will pop up and you can jump to that entity uh, quickly and go ahead and uh, perform an action or modify the properties, etc. All right, so taking a look at the favorites, uh, basically the way it works is um, so there's nothing in here currently. All you've got to do is locate the item that you want to flag as a favorite, such as reports. So off to the right, click that little star, and that'll add it to the favorites list. So when you log in, uh, you can jump directly to those items that you have flagged as a favorite. Now you'll notice here, uh, look at all these reports. Wow, oh, this is pretty much everything that's available on the web console, right? All right, so to remove it from the favorites list, just hit the minus sign and uh, to basically reset at that point. A couple of new features for Service Pack 13. All right, a couple other things that are helpful in regards to uh, making things uh, quicker and easier is the ability to uh, do a recovery a little bit quicker by uh, providing a calendar-based uh, restore view uh, to uh, locate the uh, point in time that you want to do a recovery from. So you'll see this on the uh, virtual server agent, for example. Um, uh, and uh, within the calendar, you're going to see these little blue dots. That's going to indicate that you do have some sort of recovery point or backup occurring on that date. So you select the date that you want to recover from and then uh, click the little restore uh, link there to select the point in time, uh, assuming that you have more than one uh, within that given date. So uh, it's really easy. All you've got to do is navigate to a server, for example. Um, in this case, I'm going to choose a virtual machine. Let's just choose this uh, Linux VM. And look at that, here's the uh, calendar off to the right hand side. So we'll just pick a day to recover from and then click restore. And then here's the recovery points that you can choose. So um, that's pretty much it. And then the procedure uh, you know, goes from there. So uh, really quick and easy to recover, new service pack 13 item. All right, so uh, as I alluded to a moment ago, in the reports section of the admin console are all of the web console reports. They're all integrated in now. So if we uh, take a look at the uh, admin console here, go into monitoring and reports, uh, take a look at this. Pretty much all of the reports, including that, uh, that index load report that I mentioned, uh, because I had imported it, uh, that would be in the list here too. So what's the idea here is that um, you no longer have to jump out to the web console uh, to pull in uh, one of your custom reports or one of the other fabulous reports that uh, Convault offers. All right, here's a couple of other key integrations for Service Pack 13 is the ability to uh, look at storage policies, schedule policies, and sub-client policies. These are all things that are native to the ComSell console, uh, giving existing customers an opportunity to go ahead and uh, get uh, or adapt to using the admin console. So um, this is primarily for existing customers when they upgrade uh, they will have this opportunity. Uh, these will be automatically ported over and or displayed inside of the admin console. Um, and um, uh, for new customers, you, we still want to kind of um, uh, suggest that they use uh, plans and things like that that are native to the admin console. And we were able to do this before with an additional setting. With Service Pack 13, it basically just uh, go ahead, it goes ahead and exposes it for existing customers. So uh, for existing schedules, things like that, you'll look under policies, you'll see uh, the schedule policies, sub-client policies. And here in Service Pack 13, uh, these storage policies are underneath the storage node of the navigation pane. All right, so here's something else that's, that's new. Uh, array management's been integrated in. What does this mean? Well, uh, if we look at storage here and arrays, 
So in um, previous releases, uh, we were able to add in uh, a couple, a handful of array types, such as uh, 3PAR, NetApp, and Nutanix. Um, now here in Service Pack 13, look at that. Pretty much all of the platforms, the hardware platforms and SNAP engines that we have uh, access to are all available through the admin console. So uh, one more step into um, making it possible to do everything you need right from one dashboard. Um, <clears throat> another integration here is the integration of the uh, a couple of the other web console items, such as the uh, download center and uh, links to the store and things of that nature. Uh, the way this works is really, uh, in this case, uh, it's kind of like, uh, I guess, added shortcuts uh, to the admin console. And the benefit here, I think, is that, um, you know, again, you don't have to remember or bookmark something uh, where it might be, uh, you know, a web console feature. Um, you can jump to it directly from uh, the, an, uh, the admin console here, uh, including the Commvault store. So if you need to pull down uh, some of those new reports, et cetera, uh, you can do that right through the admin console. So lots of fun stuff. All right, so moving right along here, since this is a live recorded session, just a quick check of the Q&A before we move on. Looks good. All right, messaging section, session, section. A couple of enhancements for Microsoft Exchange. So Exchange Server has this uh, tool called Messaging Records Management. And what it is designed to do is to help Exchange administrators address uh, things like uh, compliance and archive needs in terms of email messages. So these are rules that are put in by the Exchange administrator. And what Commvault has done here in this case is um, rather than uh, force people to adapt or change and uh, simply use only the rules that are available through the Exchange client in Commvault, uh, we can actually, in Service Pack 13 here, uh, import those tags or rules uh, from the Exchange server into the comm cell. So there is a utility, uh, you can pull this down, and uh, this utility will uh, bring those tags into uh, the comm serve database uh, and then in terms of uh, enabling it, uh, in terms of honoring those rules, uh, you need to enable this additional setting here, and this that'll give you the opportunity to add uh, the checkbox on the retention policy itself. So um, what happens is with, those, with that option in place and uh, leveraging the uh, exchange uh, tags, um, we will honor uh, some of those rules in, in lieu or in front of uh, some of the Commvault policies. So I've kind of outlined uh, the order of operations here on the left-hand side. I uh, just want to, uh, you know, point out that, um, you know, the cleanup policy uh, does, uh, I, you know, regardless of this feature, but also with the Exchange client in, in general, um, it is going to clean up stuff based on what you have in that policy. So. Uh, I believe there's no exception in this case uh, where potentially either stubbed files or, or messages could be cleaned up as well. So uh, just be aware of that. And again, uh, if you're interested in digging into this topic a little bit further, that's going to be available uh, in the documentation page. And there's a reference into the, uh, the links guide that I provided today. All right. I uh, just wanted to revert back to Service Pack 12 real quick uh, to just to kind of cover off on this uh, feature that came out not too long ago, which is the ability to uh, do a live browse of a database backup, an exchange database backup, extract a piece of mail, and inject it directly back into a mailbox. So, uh, well, why is this important? Well, uh, for those shops that have the occasional restore request, it may not be necessary for them to deploy the Exchange client and do uh, you know, granular uh, backups and archives uh, throughout the course of the year. Uh, maybe they just want to protect the database and that's it, and occasionally uh, attempt to uh, recover a message. Uh, well, that might be the use case here. So you can do a live browse, uh, mount that database up to the media agent, uh, locate that item, and then recover it. 
So previously, uh, we only supported uh, recovering to either a message file or a PST, uh, which in a lot of cases could help. Uh, but in this case, with this additional setting in SP12, uh, you can inject it directly back into the mailbox, so providing that you have the correct credentials and so forth. Uh, alternatively, uh, you could have used uh, the offline mining tool to do the same thing. So uh, some more progressions uh, with the exchange client and mailbox utilities. All right, a couple of things to talk about in the agents segment here on uh, SharePoint. So for SharePoint online users, um, if we're any do, doing any uh, data protection for SharePoint uh, 0365, uh, we can now uh, uh, enhance the ability for self-service for end users uh, by integrating in or mapping in uh, SharePoint online accounts. Uh, that can be done very similar to the way uh, you would do for Exchange Online. And uh, you can also enable uh, the collection of ACLs, or the access control list, um, on the, on the uh, sub-client itself. And um, when you do that, uh, if you enable that option for the first time here, uh, you need to run a full backup. So it's during the full backup when the ACLs are going to be collected. After that point in time, um, the end user could log in uh, to the web console and do the self-service, and when they uh, search for files, they're only going to see the items that they had uh, permission to based on those ACLs. So that's something new uh, for Service Pack 13, whereas previously uh, you had to be a com cell user uh, with browse permission at the very least, um, and uh, ACLs were not collected during the backup. So uh, this should clear up and uh, enhance that to make sure that everybody uh, sees the correct documents that they should have access to to make it a lot simpler to perform end, end user or self-service recovery. All right, here's another thing that's kind of been uh, put in place to enhance uh, the experience with uh, SharePoint Online. So uh, when you create the uh, client, uh, what could happen is um, Previously, uh, prior to Service Pack 13, we could have potentially uh, done the uh, setup, deploy the agents, and um, uh, create the, uh, the client, and then uh, perhaps skip a step in terms of uh, adding in the credential information. So what's uh, new here is this information is actually uh, gathered up front. So um, when you create a new backup set, and this is for uh, SharePoint Online or 0365, this information is gathered up front. So all five of these fields is required uh, during the backup set creation. So um, if for whatever reason uh, you've entered the incorrect information, it's actually checked at the uh, once you click OK. So uh, once you click OK, uh, that credential information is going to be checked, and you'll get a error message if, if something is incorrect. Now, in terms of troubleshooting, there is a log, so CVSP compatibility.log on the client, and uh, that should give you a, a reference point uh, to figure out what's going on, uh, assuming that you put in all of the credential information correctly. So a couple of enhancements um, to avoid uh, problems later. Uh, if the information wasn't entered incorrectly, when would you find out about it? Well, probably when you're trying to sleep late at night, you get a page or an alert that the job has failed. So we don't want that. And in this case, uh, we're mitigating that with uh, um, providing that, uh, that um, cross-check up front. All right, IntelliSnap and NAS segment. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the array management has been uh, added into the admin console. Uh, you can view that under the storage node. And um, uh, just a quick call out to the uh, supported storage arrays. Again, Commvault has the, uh, the Commvault platform has probably, you know, one of the largest uh, in terms of uh, compatibility. If you look at that support matrix, again, you can, <laughs> you can see all of the different platforms that uh, are available here. So um, uh, if there's uh, something new in the list that, uh, you know, it is emerging in terms of a technology. Um, you know, uh, 
as soon as it uh, picks up mainstream, there's a good chance that uh, Combo will probably get integrated with that vendor. Um, <clears throat> moving right along here. Um, so again, uh, to pull that up in the admin console, you just go to arrays, and uh, within there, you can click the add array uh, link, and uh, simply uh, proceed from there uh, based on the array type that you want to use. Something else uh, that's new here in Service Pack 13, if you have any SAP HNA environments, uh, the larger environments may be uh, clustered together. And uh, what's new in Service Pack 13 here is the ability to uh, do IntelliSnap snapshots of all the nodes or the active nodes uh, in the cluster uh, in a synchronized fashion all at the same time. So um, providing that data protection uh, with the you know, speed of IntelliSnap in a coordinated fashion. And the way this works is a lot like uh, some of our other agent types, like the virtual server agent, for example. Um, so uh, all of the nodes that have the, um, the uh, <clears throat> uh, that this has been enabled for, uh, the first node in the list will become the master and sort of coordinate uh, not only the Intel Snap and the backup process, but also the recoveries too. So uh, I, I like to think of it sort of like that, like I say, the, the way the uh, virtual server agent works with proxies in a way, uh, that first node in the HNA uh, group uh, will become the coordinator when uh, this process happens. So a couple of key points here is that um, we're only gonna snap um, any of the active nodes and um, any of the inactive nodes or standby hosts, those are not snapped uh, during that time. So um, the coordinator itself also uh, is responsible for uh, you know, updating uh, Conval and the HNA catalog with regards to whether or not the snaps were successful. All right, moving right along here. HPE store once integration. And you might be asking, well, what's all this about? Because Commvault has always been able to natively write to disk, and this is a disk-based appliance. Well, Commvault's always been able to do that. Uh, back in the day uh, when disk was kind of emerging for data protection purposes, um, <clears throat> a lot of uh, companies created uh, the virtual tape library concept uh, to uh, get that integrated. Well, Commvault always wrote to disk natively, so uh, not a huge deal there. Uh, and then the next advent of technology was integrating and deduplication. So um, that's not new here either, right? Um, so the uh, store once is HPE's latest edition of a deduplication appliance. Uh, they used to have what's called the D2D, D2D, D is in David. And uh, this is the uh, latest uh, iteration of that. Uh, it resides on the uh, virtual storage array uh, platform, which is very scalable. Uh, these uh, devices can, in terms of usable space, can uh, you know, uh, fill up two racks if you wanted to. Um, and uh, there's multiple other architectures that you could uh, take a look at from the HP documentation site. So what exactly is new here? for uh, Service Pack 13. Well, uh, what is actually happening here is we now have uh, integration with HP's deduplication engine called the Catalyst. So uh, the Catalyst technology is um, the term for HP's uh, deduplication on the store once. And uh, we can now uh, sort of put that uh, dedu uh, capability on the HP side further up where upwards into the uh, stream of the Commvault environment. So all the way out to the client side, if you like, uh, using our storage accelerator uh, agent or software package. So what does that mean? Uh, we can support all of the uh, HP uh, deduplication technologies, such as uh, replication, extend that out to our Commvault client and do source side deduplication and uh, perform synthetic pulls on appliance, which is normally a no-no, and then 
HP also has this uh, this uh, extension into the cloud called CloudLink Storage, which uh, Convo also supports as well. So there is some terminology from the HP side of things. Um, they call client side or source side duplication. They call that low bandwidth mode. Um, and then um, you know if you put it on the media agent, it's called high bandwidth mode. Uh, when we do a uh, with in in Convo land, uh, we call it a dash copy or an aux copy. They call it a catalyst copy. A synthetic full or a dash full for Convo is called a catalyst clone. Um, so just a, a few bits of uh, terminology there. And uh, the way this works uh, is really cool. It's been uh, developed uh, between uh, Conval and HP and uh, put together really nicely in that from an administrative side of things, it is very, very simple to integrate. So with Service Pack 13, uh, the way this is getting introduced is uh, you do need to add an additional setting on the ComServe so activate HPE Catalyst. What that does is it gives you the ability to add in uh, the HPE store once as a library, and then you'll be able to uh, provide the configuration information. So uh, step one is to create what's called a Catalyst store. That's on the HP side. So you go through their management console and create what's called a Catalyst store. You can have more than one store. It's a logical container within the appliance that we're going to target for our backups and archives. And uh, it may give you the opportunity to uh, either segregate data or uh, apply different rules in terms of uh, space usage and stuff like that on the HP side of things. So that's what we're going to target from the Commvault side of things. Uh, and it basically becomes another disk library inside of the Commvault software. After that, you're going to create a traditional storage policy, use that as your data pass, and then on the client side, add the storage accelerator software package, which basically gives you data movement, sort of media agent movement uh, capabilities. Now, you also on the client side need to enable this option to, again, as a sort of a safety check, ensure that that's what you want to do. Um, so that's one of the steps. All right, let's take a look at how it's integrated in here. Uh, as I mentioned, you just log into the management console for the HP, create your Catalyst store. Then on the console console, right click on the ComServe, go to the additional settings, so ComServe properties. Add in that additional setting. Set that setting to true. And then once you've uh, clicked OK here, you can then go over to Storage Resources and in the library section, create that new library. So that's when it'll appear here. So that's with that additional setting in place. Um, and then from there, like I said, the uh, next couple of steps are pretty much standard operating procedure where you're going to uh, rope this into a storage policy, uh, maybe a policy copy, whichever you choose. And then, um, you know, extend that uh, software package out to the client itself. So at a high level, this is sort of the uh, data flow. Uh, what happens is, um, uh, just like with the Commvault deduplication, uh, the only difference here is that we're going to leverage the uh, Catalyst uh, technology, which is built into that storage accelerator software package, like I mentioned. Uh, you're going to install that onto the client, and that allows you, or the uh, client rather, gets that data movement capability that's traditionally uh, done with the media agent. That will mean that the data will be sent directly to the store once. Um, it will do its deduplication, hashing, you know, checksums between the client and the store once uh, directly. Now, we do still want the media agent and Cobalt to maintain control and awareness of all the activities, so the catalog information is sent over to the media agent um, for safekeeping and references. Uh, particularly during data aging, uh, we can flag uh, which jobs are eligible to be aged. We let the catalyst or the store once know that these jobs are now aged, and it'll perform its housekeeping process. <coughs> Synthetic fulls and auxiliary copies. Well, how do you set that up? Ah, well, you just schedule it. Create the copy and you schedule it. 
uh, it couldn't really get much easier uh, the way they've set this up. Uh, really from a uh, behind the scenes standpoint, what's happening is the media agent is going to be working with the store once, kind of initiating that task and uh, requesting what's called the catalyst clone to occur on the store once. So uh, that uh, process, it's almost like a little bit of a snapshot, if you will. And uh, just like with Commvault deduplication, the uh, store once is basically going to be updating its pointers, references to the original blocks uh, within its uh, it, within its own uh, deduplication database. So uh, the cool thing is, normally or in the past, uh, if you're working with a dedupl appliance and you try to do a synthetic pull, that would mean re-reading and rehydrating the data out of the appliance through the media agent just to be rewritten and re uh, <laughs> re-ingested and deduplicated and compressed all over again, uh, which is normally a painfully slow process. So uh, generally speaking, synthetic pulls with a dedupl appliance is a no-no. Um, in this case, that's not true because we now have that integration and um, awareness with that uh, Catalyst technology built in. So no reread and no rewrite operation. So very similar to the Commvault deduplication. All right, um, question real quick. Got a question on um, the Q&A panel. So this is a live recorded session. Uh, James Bates asks if we should disable Commvault deduplication and or compression. Uh, the cool thing here is as soon as you associate a, uh, a client or subclient to the storage policy, it's going to automatically leverage the Catalyst uh, technology, assuming that you have uh, that uh, storage accelerator uh, uh, software package uh, deployed on that client. Um, so there's no need to uh, enable or disable anything. Uh, it's going to automatically flip over uh, to uh, using the uh, StoreOnce technology. All right, so in terms of replication, uh, the way this works is um, the store once the appliances, they're going to uh, send the payload amongst each other, of course. Uh, and again, we want uh, Commvault to have that job awareness and that control, uh, whereas uh, years ago, um, you know, if you're familiar with what's called a replica library or something like that, during those days, we didn't really know what the appliances were doing. We just uh, would um, be sending data to the uh, the initial target and then assume or hope that the appliances were uh, doing their replication. We have a little bit more insight here uh, with the store ones in that uh, it's actually going to be uh, controlled by Commvault. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in the case of a uh, what we would call a dash copy, uh, this uh, is actually going to be the two uh, store ones devices communicating with each other. But uh, Convol is going to initiate the uh, the action. Um, the uh, media agents at the secondary site is actually going to prefetch uh, catalog information from the source um, <clears throat> to ensure that that gets copied over first thing. <clears throat> so once that's done, um, the store once is going to be informed by the media agent of which jobs it needs to be copied. So if you've gone through the policy and have made uh, a selective uh, copy sort of with uh, specific subclients or something like that. Uh, the media agent is going to coordinate which uh, jobs to be copied over. Um, and that's about it. Again, the catalog information is going to be maintained also at the media agent level, and then the store onces are going to communicate uh, with each other as well. Uh, there's a question from uh, Joseph in the uh, chat panel. Uh, can the store wants be uh, different? Uh, I believe this question is related to uh, the model of the store once. That's my guess here. And um, to my recollection, uh, with the store once, you can uh, do sort of a hub and spoke type of configuration with different sizing. Um, so uh, from a Commvault perspective, we really just regard it as a, a disk library. So, um, you know, so long as uh, the HP side of things uh, supports that, that mo model, then uh, sh so should we. All right, so moving right along here, a couple of more points. Uh, one thing I should also note here is the documentation site is really done up well for this integration. 
So one of the things you might be asking is what about uh, size intermediate agents? Hey, if we're not using convolt lead duplication, what does that mean? Well, it means that the footprint of the media agent could actually be smaller or at least slightly different from a traditional uh, convolt lead duplication um, configuration. Um, if you're using a mixed environment, well, you know, still follow what's appropriate. Uh, but um, really what you need to do is uh, for guidance for sizing is go out to the documentation site. You're going to click on the SP13 documentation and look at the uh, media agent hardware. So um, this is done up pretty nice. The specific topic is this one, hardware specifications for media agents. And looky here. So here are all of the uh, basic, uh, in terms of guidance on uh, how to configure a media agent for hardware specs with uh, the different uh, deduplication modes. And in this case, since we're using HP's deduplication, if you're using that exclusively, then uh, you would go with a non-dedup mode media agent. So uh, there's a couple of key points out here. Uh, you can look at this from a either like a front-end terabyte perspective or the number of streams. Now, each uh, HP device, depending on what model you have, uh, there you want to make sure you look at the documentation there as well because they can handle, um, you know, if you get that smaller appliance, it may not be able to choke down 300 streams at a time, um, whereas your media agent might be able to. So make sure you, uh, you coordinate that with the actual appliance size that you're getting. And um, otherwise, uh, we're still recommending 10 gig on the media agent. Uh, the reason for this is uh, anytime you're doing any of the aux copy operations or recovery operations, we still want to have that bandwidth because the data will be transferred, um, you know, perhaps through the media agent in those cases. So uh, other than that, um, these, uh, these sizes could uh, potentially uh, be fine-tuned depending on the environment that you are in. And if you think about it here, uh, you're kind of displacing some of the uh, tasks or the role that uh, the media agent would typically play in that it's no longer handling all the data movement, especially if it's coming uh, directly from the client and going straight to the destination. So um, definitely some areas where you could, uh, you know, really get in and do some fine tuning there. Um, so incredible opportunities here. Um, I also wanted to, again, point out the documentation for uh, the this uh, integration. So let's just type in catalysts. I'm sure you could use another word, but uh, here it is, HPE store once catalyst. So like I said, uh, the documentation has actually been put together pretty well. Um, and this is specific to the catalyst integration. So, uh, you know, a little bit different than the VTL or uh, NAS configuration. Uh, that first step is creating uh, the um, the Catalyst store through the uh, management console. So believe it or not, we've actually got the steps on how to do that here. Uh, it varies based on uh, the software version that you're using on the store once. Um, and then uh, in terms of the configuration, um, in Service Pack 13, we do need that additional setting. So that's also listed here. And, um, and then creating the library is the next step and then deploying uh, the uh, storage accelerator package to the clients themselves. And then again, in SP13, that's a, an additional setting just to, you know, just a little safety net to make sure that, um, you know, this is the direction you want to go and uh, you're not expecting a different outcome or something like that. So uh, there's best practices uh, outlined here um, as well. Uh, a couple of support items, so uh, regarding, um, uh, the deduplication and compression. Um, so um, <clears throat> I think that was mentioned here in the uh, Q&A panel as well. That's all outlined here. So good job on the documentation here. And uh, one other thing to mention, two more things rather, is uh, what happens when the Catalyst uh, software uh, gets upgraded or updated? How do we handle that from a Commvault perspective? Well, guess what? It's uh, built in or integrated into that storage accelerator software package, which is the Commvault component. And uh, any updates that HP comes up with will be rolled into our service packs. So you can upgrade or update that client just like you normally would. How easy is that? 
One other thing to note here is with this release in Service Pack 13, there was a uh, performance bug identified and it is addressed with Hotfix 1161. I did double check with this uh, the other day. It is part of the latest Hotfix uh, pack. Uh, so as long as you roll that in, um, you should be good to go there. Um, quick uh, check on the uh, chat panel here. Uh, looks like we've got a couple of other questions come in. Um, the uh, question is, since the store once is doing the deduplication, there is no deduplication partition created on the media agent. Uh, that's correct. And uh, does the store once do all the hash lookups to see if the blocks and chunks have been sent correctly? Uh, yes, that is correct. So it's cruising right back to the uh, slide here. Um, that is going to be coordinated between the source and the destination, just almost like we would do with our Commvault deduplication. Uh, so before it even hits the network, there is that checksum that's going to occur uh, between the client and the target. Um, does this information get sent back to Commvault? Uh, the uh, component that does get sent to Commvault is the uh, index information or metadata catalog information. Um, the dedupe uh, engine information is not necessarily uh, shared with our media agent. That stays uh, within the store once. So I hope that answers that question. And moving right along here, let's take a look at a couple of other topics regarding uh, archiving. Uh, all right, anybody familiar with the uh, content store mailbox? Well, the content store allows us to ingest mail, uh, not only from Exchange, but other uh, entities and uh, when um, the messages are being sent to what we have called the content store uh, repository, uh, occasionally what can happen is uh, the messages are forwarded to Commvault via an email attachment. And um, what can happen is um, uh, depending on the attachment type, uh, we may actually lose some of the uh, header information, such as the uh, sender uh, and uh, uh, recipient, the blind carbon copy, stuff like that. Um, it gets uh, sort of shuffled around in that, in that mechanism there. So what we've enabled here in uh, Service Pack 13 is the option to do what's called uh, the envelope uh, format. We support that now and uh, we can capture and journal that information, uh, which you might need uh, later on during some sort of uh, compliance search or something. So the option here is uh, within the uh, journal policy itself. Uh, it's just a, a little tick. Um, and then the other feature that uh, is kind of, um, uh, I guess, noteworthy for a content store is uh, you can take an email or Outlook client, for example, and uh, view uh, the mail that has been ingested by uh, Commvault and <coughs> uh, forward and reply uh, to the messages directly from that email client. So pretty cool stuff there. Let's take a quick jump over to the virtualization segment here. All right. So I've labeled this one self-service. And the reason for this is uh, this feature, I think, is designed uh, to help individuals who uh, may not uh, be heavily involved with uh, administering a uh, data center, aren't really familiar with uh, the way a uh, virtualization platform works, and they need to get a recovery done. So um, we uh, can do a restore to a cluster. So when you do your browser recovery, uh, rather than going all the way down uh, the list and granularly you know, picking a data store, which you could do, uh, you have the option to just simply select a cluster and then with these additional settings in place, um, sort of um, enhance or override the default behavior. And uh, there's two of them here. So um, the first one is this big long one here. What this allows you to do with this in place is to um, select the cluster during the restore and um, uh, if, if a host has been you know, uh, sort of checked off in the checkbox and for whatever reason that host uh, goes offline, it's disconnected, goes into maintenance mode, uh, the software can go ahead and look around rather than just failing the job 
um, and frustrating the end user, uh, look around for an available uh, member of the cluster and use that alternate host. Similarly, uh, with this other setting here, they can do the same thing with the data store. So uh, what this allows uh, the software to do is um, if there was a data store that went offline or uh, was unavailable, maybe it filled up uh, completely full of space, uh, it can uh, go ahead and select another data store. So what it's going to do uh, with that setting in place is on a per VM basis, uh, do that check uh, for availability when, it, when that particular VM is, is queued up and ready to be restored. If you had four or five of them going at the same time, uh, it's going to do that on a per VM basis and um, look around for a data store that's accessible to the cluster. So making sure it's like uh, cluster aware, not just some standalone disk. And, um, and then uh, send it on out over to that particular data store. So again, these are two additional settings with the idea here of, um, you know, uh, reducing maybe some unintended uh, frustration on the end user uh, who may not be, you know, very, very familiar with um, uh, the actual virtualization resources uh, being under ma maintenance or decommissioned or something like that. Uh, we can have the software sort of um, uh, do more of a smart recovery for us. You just sort of shoot it at the target and uh, let the software uh, pick it out. So uh, this particular feature in Server Pack 13 is for uh, currently is for uh, in-place restores only and only for VMware. Um, now in terms of uh, troubleshooting, uh, the, the log that you would use is the vsrt.log. Uh, so basically uh, the restore log, uh, vsrt. For troubleshooting. All right, uh, another little item on virtualization and recoveries is the ability to inject new IP address information into Linux VMs. Pretty cool. So we've had this capability with Windows for quite a while, and <coughs> uh, what this allows you to do, either through a, uh, a restore, a, a live sync, or something of that nature. Uh, some sort of replication is to inject a new IP address into the Linux VM. So how does it work? In Service Pack 13, uh, what you do need to do is on the destination, excuse me one moment, rocking and rolling throughout this session here, got a little dried out. Uh, you do need to deploy the file recovery enabler. So this is a little OVA. It's a uh, more or less a Commvault uh, appliance, um, and that's going to assist us with this process here. So you might be thinking, well, you know, uh, not too long ago uh, we uh, integrated that into MediaAgent software. Um, so in Surf Pack 13, um, this is still the case. You still do need the Pharrell or file recovery enabler at this point in time um, uh, as this feature is being introduced. Uh, so again, with that component in place, what's going to happen is when you recover the data, uh, send it over to the destination, uh, the Pharrell is going to be mounting up that disk and uh, updating the IP address information inside of the configuration file for that uh, uh, Linux OS type. Uh, so once it's done that, it can release the mount, and then the uh, virtual machine can be powered up with the new settings in place. So the key points there is really just uh, in SP13, uh, you can uh, replace IP addresses for Linux VMs, and uh, in the case of Service Pack 13, uh, you need to use that uh, additional um, component there called the File Recovery Enabler. Uh, again, that's in the documentation if you have any questions. Uh, it's pretty well laid out there. Jumping over to uh, public cloud segment, uh, stepping away from the private cloud for a moment. In SP13, we have early release support for AWS and Azure uh, doing IntelliSnap. Um, on the VM group inside of the admin console, it's simply a uh, flick of a switch there. And uh, what's going to happen behind the scenes is Commvault's going to go ahead and create the associated, uh, you know, primary snap copy, the schedules, and so forth, and also the snap retention. By default, is going to be set to eight recovery points. This is definitely something that you can modify. 
So just to FYI there, the default setting for the recovery points is going to be set to 8. Other than that, I uh, just flip the switch and it's uh, ready to go. So that's going to take advantage of the uh, built-in um, AWS and Azure uh, Snap engines out there. All right, so a couple other items, uh, public cloud related, is uh, the uh, Amazon Relational Database Services. So these are services from AWS. Uh, so basically you can host uh, database instances inside of Amazon. Uh, they have a wide variety of uh, database platform support and uh, these are the ones that uh, we can also uh, integrate in uh, and support in terms of data protection and service pack 13. So ranging from uh, SQL to Oracle and a few others, uh, it depends on the type of uh, data protection that you want to do. So um, Amazon actually uh, supports two mechanisms for doing data protection. Uh, we can't actually inject an agent or anything like that inside of the uh, database instance itself. Uh, that is you know, more or less a proprietary AWS item. Um, but we can uh, stick a proxy server out there. Uh, ideally, it would be in the same uh, region as the uh, database instance. And that's going to help facilitate this process of doing one of two things. Uh, either a uh, built-in sort of dump or export, so that's one mechanism. Uh, so the, the database types that uh, support that, uh, we can integrate with that, sort of coordinate the uh, process, uh, you know, collect the uh, job statistics, and also uh, report on that information. Uh, same thing with uh, IntelliSnap support through AWS. Uh, we can do that also with these uh, database types here in Service Pack 13 as well. So um, uh, just like we would have years ago, the conversation around uh, using something like the SQL agent and having that conversation with the database administrator, uh, this is kind of the same concept, I think, here where we can have that conversation and say, hey, you know what, All, you're going to need to protect that data anyways, uh, or ideally you should. Um, just because it's in the cloud doesn't make it uh, perfectly safe. And therefore, uh, you can continue to do all of your data management and data protection through Commvault software. All right, one other item to uh, mention is also the uh, Oracle Cloud infrastructure called OCI. Um, so um, this is a, a platform as a service, if you will, uh, for Oracle. And uh, what's new in Service Pack 13 is we have a new uh, Oracle uh, OCI uh, pseudo client. So you'll see that if you uh, click add new client, um, this guy will show up here. And uh, when you create the uh, client, it's much like any of the other ones where uh, you're basically going to be inputting in the configuration information, the path, and that sort of stuff uh, to that particular account. Um, so again, uh, what Commvault can do is uh, coordinate the uh, backup schedule, uh, do the recovery and reporting, um, and the, um, uh, ind the Commvault index server is what's going to be uh, you know, used to sort of collect the metadata information about any of these uh, backups that are performed on uh, that platform. So a couple of key points here is um, in Service Pack 13, it's rolled into the console console. And uh, if you have uh, multiple uh, OCI cloud accounts, uh, you'd want to create an individual OCI client for each one of them. Uh, as you can see here, uh, that account information is kind of unique uh, on the client uh, settings itself there. All right. Uh, kind of wind down here, let's revert back to looking at some of the cool uh, alerts and reports. A couple of new ones for Service Pack 13. Uh, we have a new anomaly dashboard and something called inferred ownership. So these are both items that you could pull down uh, from the Commvault store. Um, and um, <clears throat> there's a bunch, bunch more. So this is really a good opportunity again to go back to the documentation site and take a look. I'm just going to type in reports in the search bar and take a look here at our available reports. Look at that list. Wow. Isn't that amazing? 
goes on and on and on and on. So what this means is uh, if you're looking for a particular type of reporting or, or some sort of function, there's a good chance that it may already be out there. And so uh, feel free to explore this. Uh, perhaps some, you know, all of these, almost all of these can be uh, tuned and uh, filtered and adjusted to, uh, to your exact criteria, uh, if you will, so you don't have to go and build a custom report. So uh, let's take a look at this anomaly uh, report here um, or the uh, dashboard. Uh, what it's intended to do is sort of summarize any anomalies that are detected so for example, uh, if a job is suddenly running for days and days and days, and normally it takes 30 minutes to do a backup, uh, that would be an unusual event. Uh, so that would show up. Uh, you can also trigger an alert uh, based on something like that. And through the dashboard here, if you look at the data views, so I'm just kind of uh, demonstrating what's available here in the documentation site. You can see some of the data views that you would get from this particular report. Um, both uh, events and jobs are displayed. And again, giving it sort of the uh, charts and the dashboards type of view. Um, <clears throat> so uh, depending on uh, what type of event you're looking at, uh, the different type of information will be displayed. And what this allows you to do is to quickly act on the issue. So if there was one of those jobs that had fallen behind for whatever reason, you could simply click on it directly from the report and uh, you know get uh, get busy in terms of correcting the problem. Uh, let's see that other one here, inferred. Where's that at? Ownership report. So what is this about? So this display displays the files and folders that users are accessing during a specific period of time. So where might this might be helpful is. Um, uh, uh, for a few use cases, I believe, uh, it's definitely going to be an add-on assistance in terms of an archiving solution. Uh, normally, we're looking at um, uh, the modified time or the access time or something like this. This might actually give you a little bit different perspective in seeing like what uh, files are actually you know most popular in a given share or something like that. So a couple of new ones there, and uh, like I say. Uh, you know, definitely go and explore some of the items out here. There's tons and tons of stuff for virtualization, uh, tons and tons of stuff for uh, health reporting. Uh, there's that index load report. Uh, there's uh, growth and trending, all sorts of stuff that's built in here. All right, so uh, in terms of alerts and reports, um, a lot of that uh, information that's gonna be displayed is uh, basically uh, derived from some of the settings that you put inside of your plans and other policies. Now these can be set at the system level um, and you can put in uh, different things related to what's called the uh, strike count or the key performance indicators. Uh, set up SLAs, uh, allow some grace periods for certain groups of clients and uh, here it is, your recovery point objectives and RTOs. So you'll see a lot of the reports, the, you know, we have the RPO uh, uh, dashboard um, and the uh, live sync uh, monitor. Those kind of things are kind of derived from some of these settings. So this is where it is at the global level. Uh, again, you can also set these up at either the client level or the group level. So if you have uh, mission critical machines, they may have a slightly different uh, setting there or no setting at all. Uh, these will also pop up inside of the health reports and the recovery readiness reports. So it's all about being ready to recover, right? So let's take a look at that. Uh, this is what it would look like through the admin console. Again, giving that, that dashboard style of view, uh, you can quickly jump to any of the red guys and uh, you know get more details on that information, uh, do some filtering. That exact same report is available through the web console. Take a look there. And uh, here it is. So RPOs, uh, perhaps for uh, virtual machines in this case, we're looking at the live sync monitor. And you can quickly see based on uh, your uh, recovery point settings uh, where you're at in terms of uh, being synchronized and up to date. Uh, so again, you can, um, you know, through the uh, dashboard here, uh, jump to or perhaps uh, you know, get it more information. Maybe something's in progress at that point. 
uh, the health report and um, and also um, the worldwide dashboard has been updated. So uh, back in SB12, this was completely redesigned uh, to give you more uh, pertinent information up front in sort of a more uh, cleaner fashion. Uh, let's take a look if I'm still logged in here. Uh, we can take a look at the dashboard real quick. And give you sort of a live view. So logged into the web console. Here's the sort of the dashboard for worldwide level. So if you have an environment that uh, has multiple cells throughout the uh, geography, uh, it can be looked at holistically from the worldwide view. And again, uh, looking directly, you can jump right to you know some of those uh, critical items. Um, you know, immediately just right from the dashboard. So very, very interactive and, and intuitive. Now for individual cells, uh, it's also the same uh, kind of concept, uh, you know, same kind of look and feel. Um, so they keep it simple there. Um, the same thing with the, uh, the health report, uh, same kind of concept here. So any of these tiles, uh, again, you can jump to the critical items and uh, perhaps uh, you know have this report sent out uh, to other administrators. So we've got the capacity planning and, and things like that all listed throughout the uh, health report. So uh, as a partner and a Conval employee, you know this is definitely one of the uh, or a few of the tools that we could use to engage and uh, you know help the uh, success of our customers making sure that uh, they're uh, getting the data protection that they need. Um, and of course, uh, looking at some of those recovery point objectives, uh, you know, perhaps it's an indicator of some infrastructure problems or a resource shortage, right? All right, a couple more things. We're coming up to the bottom of the hour and uh, we're gonna wrap up here with a couple of cool items. So hyperscale and appliance. Uh, Commvault has released a new appliance. It's called the Remote Office 1100. What is it for? Well, it is for those small office and remote offices that need a little help from Commvault. Uh, you can get more information on this guy right at uh, commvault.com. Wrong site. Commvault.com, right on the homepage. There we go. <clears throat> um, I guess it's been moved. I apologize for that. Anyhow, uh, the the small appliance is got it has internal disk in a RAID 5 configuration up to about 15 terabytes usable capacity. Has integrated in uh, SSD for the index and deduplication databases. So uh, it could be deployed as a standalone. Um, sort of uh, combo install like ComServe and Media Agent or a Media Agent only if you just simply want to do that hub and spoke configuration, put a uh, Commvault presence out there with, uh, you know, a uh, all-in-one box, um, you know, you don't have to uh, uh, look around for any uh, particular hardware or anything like that, it's available. Now for hyperscale specifically, a couple of new uh, enhancements as a service pack 13 is uh, the support for the uh, integrated one gig management interface of uh, the appliance or the hyperscale appliances come with 10 gig interfaces typically. And um, so this is uh, more or less for the management aspects of the uh, nodes themselves. There's also a really cool uh, driver replacement uh, tool that is actually integrated into the admin console. So uh, you can see failed drives and uh, do uh, sort of logical driver replacement uh, like you would with a tape library um, right through the admin console. The uh, deployment and imaging process for the uh, appliances has also been improved uh, to where it's uh, broken up into stages, which means uh, if there's a connectivity problem or something like that throughout the deployment, uh, you could revert back to the last known good uh, accomplishment or the, the stage of the deployment process. And there's also a factory reset option now They'll help you clean things up uh, if for whatever reason uh, something goes really bad, 
and you want to get a clean, clean start uh, rather than a bunch of manual uh, processes, uh, it's sort of bundled up into a factory reset package. So that's kind of new for the uh, hyperscale appliance. Let's move on to a couple of honorable mentions and close it out for today. So did you know that you can use Google Assistant or Amazon Alexa to do some Commvault tasks? Well, uh, if you have one of those services and uh, the appropriate uh, smartphones or other devices uh, and connectivity to your Commvault environment, you could just ask Google or Alexa, hey, is there anything wrong with my comm cell? Now, depending on uh, the type of information that's uh, re, uh, uh, produced, Alexa or Google, uh, for that matter, may say, hey, would you also like me to send you a report? Sure. So think about it. You could spend your entire day at the beach just talking to your uh, your device uh, and uh, getting updates periodically on uh, the Commvault environment. Um, and of course, uh, you know, it'll send you a report uh, with that uh, related information too. So kind of a cool feature there. Uh, you don't even have to log in or get behind the keyboard, right? You just uh, ask Google. A couple other uh, cool things integrated in to, again, sort of help out with the ease of uh, notifications is um, push updates to the Commvault mobile app. So within the control panel is where you're going to set this up. And uh, what this means is if you're using either the Commvault Edge or Commvault Now apps on your uh, mobile device, uh, those notifications can be pushed out and you'll get a uh, sort of a little icon indicator uh, just like you would with like a new mail or something like that. Um, in the virtualization space, uh, we have ServiceNow integration. So ServiceNow is a uh, cloud platform. And um, again, um, Commvault is really going out of the way to not only provide uh, integration with so many platforms out there, uh, here is another way where with a Commvault package that can be integrated into ServiceNow, these administrators can perform their own backups from that native console, uh, the ServiceNow console itself. So perform a backup and a restore uh, right from uh, their uh, ServiceNow console, and also uh, they can get uh, job statuses and things like that without having to really become a Commvault administrator. Um, same thing with uh, vRealize from VMware. We talked about this last quarter. Uh, we have that integration as well. Uh, so natively to that console with the Commvault package in place, uh, it becomes more or less a menu item to do some Commvault tasks. All right, now this is the, probably the last one I'm going to lead off with you for today uh, is the PowerShell module for Commvault. Now you're going to get this from the Commvault store. I've been talking about that a lot today. Uh, it is a, uh, a bundle of uh, commandlets and things like that that you can import into um, uh, PowerShell. Um, and on the Commvault store, if we go out there real quick, there we go. Just going to type in PowerShell. See what we get. There it is, Commvault PowerShell module. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this is where you're going to find the user guide uh, for this particular uh, option here, uh, as well as doing the download itself. So this is the package. You're going to download that. And then uh, here is the user guide, which you can also uh, download. So it tells you about the deployment. I'll show you that in a moment, as well as some of the uh, command type of uh, features and functions that you can do uh, with this bundle. All right, so how does it work? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you're going to download the, um, the package, right? We talked about that. You're going to unpack the bundle and import it. And one thing you do need to do is make sure that you have a supported version of PowerShell installed. Uh, when I did this the other day, uh, PowerShell 5.1 was available. And then from that point forward, uh, I can go ahead and uh, import them in. So pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, in fact, I can show it to you in just a matter of moments, literally. Uh, so once you have that download done, uh, we're going to log into the server here, launch PowerShell. What's step number one? Uh, verify the PowerShell version. 
So it's a simple command there. And we want to have uh, that 5.0 or above. And uh, then we just need to locate our download here. And unpack it. So basically just extract it. It's a compressed uh, package. Uh, we get a little folder there. Then uh, back inside of the PowerShell side of things, uh, we're basically going to set the path to where to get that uh, installer and import that in. So you'll type in the path. Fast forward a little bit here. And at that point, you can do the install dot slash uh, install. That's going to uh, really quickly uh, zap in all of the uh, commandlets, etc., into PowerShell. And at that point, the next step is to connect to the ComServe and start uh, performing uh, queries. Uh, so connect to ComServe. Uh, you'll need to put in the appropriate credentials. So here's our ComServe server name. Put in the credentials. And uh, once this is in place, uh, you can go ahead and perform uh, the PowerShell command itself. So, for example, here we'll do uh, get client. Uh, this will basically give us a list of clients that are available. And there you go. So, easy, easy integration. And just to wrap up here, I want to thank everybody for your time today. I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. Don't forget that all of these are recorded. These sessions are available. So, if you need to uh, get up to speed, uh, there is no version uh, 10 to current version 11 Delta class, but we do have these quarterly updates, and they are recorded. They're out there on Partner University and Commvault University for you to consume whenever you want. And uh, there's other stuff out there, too, like um, the uh, walkthrough demos and things and uh, the license champion stuff we talked about. Don't forget about the on-demand learning library. And uh, with that, I would again like to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Jim Anderson, uh, John Fox, and uh, Mr. Luke Walker from Products for assisting in the panelists uh, during this quarter session. And thank all of you, and uh, hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you very much. Jim Anderson, take it away. Thanks.